So the royal family are certainly in crisis. Prince Harry jetting over the Atlantic to see his father, King Charles, for less than 45 minutes after that shock cancer diagnosis. And that was their first one-to-one -one meeting in over a year and a half. Meanwhile, Prince William heading back to work today for the first time since his wife Kate spent two weeks in hospital after undergoing abdominal surgery. Well, joining us now, Sunday Times royal editor, Roy Anika, and royal biographer Hugo Vickers, who has been writing about the royals for half a century. <laughs> Couldn't speak to two more plugged-in people <laughs> into what's happening in the royal family. Roya, would you describe it as a crisis? We have a very slimmed-down, deliberately slimmed-down royal family, which now looks like it's a little bit under strain mm. because the monarch has to withdraw a little bit from public duties and we've got Prince Harry jetting back in but hardly spending any time at all with his dad. It's, I mean, crisis is the word that the palace always love to try and avoid, um, and they will sort of pitch it as a, as a reshuffling of the order. Um, I think the one good thing that we keep hearing is that Charles will continue with his state duties, and he's able to keep doing those audiences with Rishi Sunak and do his red boxes. That's encouraging. I think if he wasn't, then we'd be in crisis territory with councillors of state stepping in. The Harry thing is interesting. I mean... We were wondering what it would take to get Harry across the pond to see his dad face to face. You know, he barely saw him at the coronation. Um, and I don't think we should read too much into how much time he spent with him. Um, what, but about, it's... what about the speed of his reaction in coming across? Because people are reading something yeah. like that. I, I don't see that as ominous. I would have thought it was very strange if Harry had had that call with his dad to say, I've got cancer and he hadn't come. Mm. Um, and he's, he's quite got, impulsive, isn't he? Harry? He is, he's impulsive, and he's got engagements in, in Canada next week, so, uh, you know, if he hadn't come this week, when would he have seen him? Uh, you know, father to son, whatever's happened in the last few years, still father and son, I can see why he'd want to see him after a so, cancer diagnosis. Uh, and I absolutely agree. I mean, it would be bizarre mm. if he didn't immediately... He's got the money, he's not lacking in funds. Yeah. Come over, give support. It's a devastating diagnosis, however good the prognosis. Mm. But when you say don't read too much into the amount of time they spent together, mm. it's hard not to when you think, you know, I would spend more than half an hour with my dad in that situation. The, the, the briefing that came out from that, from the palace, was interesting. There was a... The king was very tired after his procedure that he'd had the day before. And so, so we know he started his treatment on Monday. We understand he had um, a, a, a procedure then for, for the... Um, for his cancer, and, and the briefing was he felt quite tired. Right. And, you know, I'm sure Harry would have loved to have spent much more time with him, but he's probably quite respectful of his dad going through his well, treatment. Then that, but that's a very obvious reason. And therefore, to use the amount of time that they spent together mm. as evidence that there is no chance of reconciliation is completely false. I agree. And also, it's been suggested by other sources that Harry and his father have not ruled out another meeting while Harry is here. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Harry, uh, Hugo, rather, um, what's your take on how the royals are managing this? Well, I think they're managing as best they possibly can. If I could just throw in another thought about that meeting, um, there's a helicopter taking off, and presumably that has to be done in more or less in daylight, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So if he wants to get back to Sandringham, he can't hang about. OK. And it's, as Roy says, I mean, there's every possibility that they can meet again and they can talk. What you're both really saying is everybody just needs to calm down a bit on this. <laughs> I do think yeah. that's the, the case, yeah. yes. I mean, uh, um, it is, as, as Roy says, very good news that the King is continuing his duties. I mean, when, the, when we had lockdown, it was wonderful to see the Queen doing Zooms and to know that she was all right, even if we didn't actually see her in person. Mm -hmm. So that's all very good. So no councillors of the state and things. Mm -hmm. But the slimmed-down monarchy, I mean, you should, everybody should always listen to what Princess Anne says the whole time. When she says it doesn't look very good from where I'm standing, I couldn't <laughs> agree with her more. I've always thought that because people do want the royal family to do things and there aren't very many of them operational at the moment. What about the pressure on William? He is under real pressure. His dad's just been diagnosed with cancer. He's having to, to, to step back from his duties. William's expected to step up to the plate, but he's got a very poorly wife at home. And let's not forget, she spent two weeks in hospital. That is a long time. And she's not coming bed. back to public duties until Easter at the early. No, she isn't. But, I mean, he, he, he will... He'll have had plenty of time to think about wh where his duties are going to be at any particular time, just as, as the king did before he became the throne. <coughs> so Prince William will be able to, um, to step in and do, do these things. That won't be a problem at all, I don't think. What about Prince Harry possibly doing some royal duties no, no. while he's it? Well, you say that very firmly. <laughs> I do it? say that very <laughs> like firmly. Like a sort of stern parent. I tell you what you I go. think is that I think that... Um, I think uh, uh, there, there's two, two ways of looking at this visit from Prince Harry. Let's hope that he was concerned about his father and came over to see him. That, as I've been saying a lot, was a great tonic because the king has wisely left the door wide open for him to come any time he wanted. Mm. 
and he's taken that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that will have given the king a huge boost, and that's what I hope will happen. What I, if I'm, mm. you know, conflict, um, if Prince Harry came along and was whinging and whining about his, his woes and things, well, that wouldn't be good, but I don't suppose for one minute that that was the case. From your inside knowledge, who is more hostile to who? Does the hostility flow more from William to Harry because of what Harry's said and done, or does it flow from Harry to William because of what's happened in the past? Well, I don't know, but I would have thought it was mutual, personally. Really? 50-50? Yeah. And on what ba how would you define the basis of that hostility? What would you define well, the Well, I mean, uh, um, I, think, I think the King has been incredibly forbearing. He has yeah. never responded to any of the jibes that have come from California in his direction. I personally think that Prince William, because of maybe the closeness of the relationship that they had all those years before, has taken it much harder. That's mm. what I think. What do you think? Um, I, I, look, you know, there have been books, there have been documentaries, there have been an Oprah interview, a lot of things have been said, and I don't think anyone expected this visit from Harry to be some sort of huge reconciliation, no. really. Do you see that they can be reconciled? Because Prince Harry wrote a lot about their relationship. I think he described it as a rolling catastrophe and he alleged an attack by William, a physical attack by William on him, which ended up in a dog bowl being broken. Mm -hmm. And he also made comments about Kate as well. But at some point, he presumably, you know, for the sake perhaps of a father who has a cancer yeah. diagnosis, you know, you, people might think, well, put it behind you. Siblings have fallouts. People's wives don't get on. That's yeah. a fact of family life sometimes. It is, and it's a fact of family life that not all families get along and not all siblings get along, and I think sometimes the public want that reconciliation more than the brothers do. <laughs> right. OK. Interesting. What about Princess Anne? Um, one keeps hearing her name cropping up here. You talk, quite rightly, Susanna, about a slimmed-down monarchy perforce. Mm. Um, is there room for her to do more? She couldn't do any more. I mean, Hugo will tell you, <laughs> really? she does so many engagements every day that we, we, we don't always go along to them because we don't get told about them quite often. She, you know, when this diagnosis was announced on Monday evening, Anne was out <clears throat> doing her engagements. She did several engagements yesterday. She went up to Nottingham. She is one of the great workhorses of the royal family. The, you know, the king trusts her. It's a great thing that he knows he's got her, Edward, Sophie, William, C Queen Camilla, huge role for her now, even bigger role supporting, you know, the public-facing duty. I think Anne, I don't think she could do any more, but she is, you know, mm -hmm. stepping up to the plate, as well, always. Well, I think she will do more, actually. And I think... <laughs> I, I think that How? It, it'd in be her diary? Interesting. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> ask a busy man, ask a busy woman. Yeah. I mean, she... In a sense, what uh, I've noticed about Princess Anne is that I'm, I'm not sure that um, Prince Charles and Princess Anne were terribly close during, you know, the recent years, but the moment he became king, I mean, she sees this new role. It's her role to support him in every way possible, and I've seen a lot of that, and I think that she will be crucial. She calls him old bean, doesn't she? Isn't that Does she? Yes. Point? Well, I wouldn't be surprised, but she... Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think now it's a really good relationship. The, and the, it... the one thing... We all hope and pray that, that the optimistic prognosis for the, the King's cancer is exactly that, optimistic, and that it bears fruit. Uh, what we don't know, uh, no one ever knows when they're going for uh, extensive cancer treatment, is how they're going to respond to that treatment, mm. whether it's radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And, and short term, it can make people feel a lot more ill. We know, we know that. Um, that being the case, might we be looking at some kind of temporary regency if Prince Charles doesn't respond very well to his treatment well, in terms uh, of the I mean, short term? The, the, the Constitution is, is clear. I mean, the appointed Council of State. Uh, councils of state, um, and, and they would operate temp temporarily if the king was unwell and couldn't do his duties. Mm -hmm. That has happened in previous reigns for a little bit. It's also happened when the monarch goes abroad. Um, right. A regency would be a very serious thing. We go back to George III when he was permanently ill, and then you had um, George IV stepping in as Prince Regent. Mm -hmm. and, and people keep saying, oh, you know, was, was, the, was the queen going to abdicate? No, she was not going to abdicate, but had she not been able to fulfil her role, there would have been a, Prince Charles would have become the regent. And Briefly, the one person we haven't mentioned in the entire interview is Camilla. Oh, we did. Did we? I missed <laughs> that. Did you say that? Oh, yeah, she been will keep calm, and, keep calm and carry on, and Charles will be very pleased to have oh, you her by his side. Yes, yeah. Both of you, thank you very much indeed.